And I remember like all the, the emotions that I was feeling at the time. And when I heard about that project, I instantly knew it was something that we could do and we could take that idea and we could build upon it. You know, instead of one or two people, what if we just invited the entire battalion? get started first of all we we would love for you all to kind of introduce yourselves really quickly this is a first time we've had so many guests on our podcast so we're incredibly excited want to make sure that you all um just have a moment so i'm just going to go in the order of my screen so Waylon, um if you could just tell me quickly your name and just sort of identify yourself uh, i am Waylon mcdo and i'm the chairman of the do gooders of hampton roads and hampton roads where is that virginia Fantastic. Okay, Israel. Um, Israel Lopez. I'm stationed in Fort Eustis uh, under under uh, Boyce Buckner, who's my uh, commander. Uh, I am a course management officer and also his equal opportunity leader for the battalion. Incredible. Okay, Ghana. Hi, I'm Ghana Smith, and I am the volunteer coordinator with the Barrett Peak Heritage Foundation, which is located in Hampton, Virginia. And Boyce. Uh, my name is Boyce Buckner. I'm a, a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army, a battalion commander uh, stationed here at Fort Eustis, Virginia, and have the uh, honor and pleasure to serve with all those wonderful people in this unity through community effort. Fantastic. Um, so, so did you guys, did you know Mary, did you all know Mary Christian? I, yes, I did, and Waylon also did. Yes. And, and was she, like, what was she like? Because she was, it seems, you know, little you can tell from this story, she seems like she was a force of nature. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Donna, you want to take that? You want me to? <laughs> <laughs> we both can. We uh, probably okay. have our own individual stories, but um, yeah. she definitely was a force of nature. Um, through just her own story and her own legacy, um, being uh, the first African-American to represent on the school board in the city of Hampton. Um, she was also uh, the dean at Hampton University. And then she uh, served in our general assembly for the state. So just politically, she was a force to be reckoned with. But she was also this kind hearted community person. Uh, I remember the first time I met her, um, it was, we used to call it holding court. And you would just sit and just listen to her stories. Um, and she would also listen to your stories, which made it so great. So it was kind of like, she was everybody's mother and grandmother and auntie, and she would not forget. You know, it was amazing, like you would, see her again weeks or months later and she would ask follow-up questions from a story that you told her so long ago. So it was just, she was an amazing person. I remember the first time I met her and she just said, with a name like Ghana, I will never forget it. And it was like, but you know so many people, but she still remembers the little things. So she was amazing. Now, <laughs> now this, this place that you're all at now, some of you are stationed there, some of you lived there a long time. What is Hampton like? Depends on who you ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Hampton, Hampton's like, uh, this is the place for me. It's the place where people come to um, retire uh, or raise a family. Um, I grew up here. My father was military, so that's how I ended up here. Uh, he was in the Air Force, so he retired at Langley Air Force Base. Um, so we ended up here and, and it's, it's more, and that's what it's turned into. It's a retirement community, but it's also fam, so family oriented. Um, you know, you have hear the, the people say that you, you never meet a stranger. Mm -hmm. That's Hampton. You meet somebody in Hampton and, and they, you automatically become friends or family. Uh, so that's what Hampton is for me. So Mary, so I assume this this graveyard that we're going to talk about it, it, it's all I mean it's been there a long time, and it had it had sort of so Mary had just passed by it a many one one time too many to 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 not have it uh, be kept. I mean, like what 
what was the impetus here? You know, Ghana, you're shaking your head. What, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, actually, um, her family is, um, has, she has several family members buried there. So she grew up knowing uh, specifically Bassett. Bassett is one of the cemeteries. Um, the two cemeteries that we work in are actually across the street from one another. But she kind of grew up uh, tr like the traditional African-American family where you would go and visit the cemetery and place flowers out there, especially on um, Memorial Weekend. And so over time, she watched the cemeteries just oh, become overgrown. So she remembered it as a child where it was freshly cut grass to um, what we see it today. So um, that that's what motivated her as well. It was just like, it was disheartening for her to see the final resting place for her family members to look the way it did. So she decided that this would become a project and, and how did the community come to, you know, what, how did she present that to the community? How did you, how did you get involved Donna and, and, and Waylon and everybody else? Well, one thing is for sure, when when Dr. Christian called you, you came. So that was one way, um, because when we first started, you know, it wasn't social media. It was really simple. Pick up that phone and she would call people out and people would they would actually first have breakfast together and then they would go over to the cemetery um, and just bring their tools and start working. So that was how I first found out about it was I got a call that uh, Dr. Christian is making a call for us to come out and help. So that's how I got started. Now, the, the first time that, that everybody went there, you know, the, there's a picture in the article, it's mm -hmm. completely overgrown. I mean, it just looks like, you know, a field. So, so you know, how did you how did, did, did everybody, and, and a lot of people showed up. So how did, how did it, um, how did that day come to be? And, and what did it, what did it seem like? I mean, why did, it, why did everybody go, you know? Um, so we've been working on this project for some years. Um, and what had happened was the city used to take care of uh, the cemeteries. Um, over the course of uh, time, they, they no longer took that responsibility on. So it was really, we had a call to action and, and reached out to a lot of people that we knew that owned lawn services, uh, things like that, so that we could uh, minimize the number of people out there, one, because the pandemic had just happened um, and wanted to be make sure that people were safe, but also relying on um, our personal contacts to make sure that we had people that were gonna actually show up. So now, boys, how do you get involved? And you and Israel, how does, when, when do you get involved? <laughs> how do you hear about this project? We're trying to put all the pieces together. Well, absolutely. I'm happy to, to jump in. It's truly an honor. Um, so we were inspired, you know, by just the, the just, awful circumstances and division in our country as a result of the murder of George, George Floyd Jr. Um, it hit our unit hard. Uh, as you can imagine, having an organization that is just comprised of, of so many different, you know, races, people walk from life, uh, and we're taught to be family. Um, and then that strikes and it's, it can be divisive even in, in a small tight organization like ours. Um, and so uh, Israel, who he mentioned, he serves as my battalion equal opportunity uh, leader. We have a command program that, that takes care of that for us in the military. Um, you know, where we as, as commanders and leaders emphasize, you know, the treating of, of equal, you know, opportunity, equity, treating others with dignity and respect is what it boils down to. Um, and so I bring Israel in, I call to action all of my people, you know, like Dr. Christian, I say, leaders, it's time to lead. Uh, we sit down together in a room and we have a technique that's not very uncommon across our country where it's you bring in your smart people to sit down and say, it's time for us to figure out something and figure it out fast. Uh, and the first was having the hard conversation. Just being able to talk about something like that across every soldier and every family member and civilian employee we have was hard. Um, and then we started to see the headlines of the Minnesota National Guard and some of the negative press that was coming. And, and I looked at them and said, listen, we have to uh, get involved to show everybody that uh, we are in uh, with everyone else, that there's more at stake, you know, um, than what we think. And, and one of the key things that we do is we lead by doing. 
one of our principles in the army is, you know, selfless service. Uh, and so I challenged Israel, I challenged our team of, of just amazing young leaders uh, to go forth and to help find recommendations as we continued our conversations um, so that they could propose what we think the way ahead looked like. Uh, and Israel being the, the brilliant young leader that he is. And I will tell you, you know, folks, I have served with, you know, a myriad of soldiers in my 25 year career in the army. Uh, and this one is a special one, keep an eye on him. Um, so he comes in with everybody again and, and I can feel it, he's excited. Sir, I got an idea. Uh, the team came together and proposed um, the circumstances and the situation, you know, that Waylon and Ghana have described the history behind it and everything. And I just thought to myself, what a perfect opportunity, like you had me at, you know, at the first sentence of just going out and helping restore these two cemeteries. Um, but we had to come up with, you know, what we thought was the right name for it. Uh, and we were looking on how we can help bring unity in our community. And so that's where it came from. Unity through community is what our organization calls it. Uh, it is a, a monthly um, partnership and relationship and it's grown into family, you know, Waylon and Ghana, a brother and sister, you know, and um, and the folks who routinely come out, the idea was that that September weekend, the September 21st, was our first call to action to bring out every volunteer, um, you know, from our organization and asking others, who wants to come out, grab your tools uh, and help us, you know, uh, just do right by these areas and reconnect. Uh, and after it was done, uh, let's come together uh, let's bring some donated food and let's just share a meal together, break bread. Because again, community like Dr. Christian, you know, and what Ghana just highlighted, have a meal, sit and talk story, be able to connect as people again and, and get past everything that was just dividing everybody, you know, and it wasn't necessarily in this particular group, but we could feel it in other areas. Uh, and I will tell you, um, you know, anybody who listens or hears is that, you know, it was, it was just like Ghana described in the article, it was just so much more than what we expected. Uh, the outpour from the Hampton Roads community, uh, from the military, from everybody involved, uh, and it became contagious. Uh, and I think that's really where it began, kind of the spark, which has kind of turned into a, a fire now of just amazing selfless service, you know, and, and community and, and what I would call just, uh, just that connectedness that we were all hoping for, right? So it was, it was pretty epic. But I'd, I'd love to get Israel in here as well, just to, to talk his, his experience too. Yeah, now Israel, did you, what, what was it? Did you see an article? Did you, did you talk to Ghana? How did, you, how did you come up with this as an idea? Like, so you, you see George Floyd, you see that on television, you see the same images we're all appalled by. And then, you know, you're sort of challenged to think of a project, you know, how, do, how does your mind add up to this thing? Well, sir, I, uh, it's funny because I was actually having a conversation with a friend of mine, uh, another colleague, and he mentioned a restoration project that he had done elsewhere. There's a lot of volunteerism that goes on in the military. Yeah. It's kind of one of the things that we, we do to give back. And it just so happens that he mentioned that around the same time that uh, Lieutenant Colonel Buckner and I had sat down and had that, that open, very candid uh, conversation. And I remember like all the, the emotions that I was feeling at the time. And when I heard about that project, I instantly knew it was something that we could do and we could take that idea and we could build upon it. You know, instead of one or two people, what if we just invited the entire battalion and said, hey, we've got this, this fantastic idea and how would you like to give back? And that's really what it became. Um, where, did, where did you hear about it? Uh, it, was, it was just at work. I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues, uh, Staff Sergeant Mwangi, and he was telling me about a restoration project that he had done down in Richmond. And he was telling me the state of the cemetery. And uh, I knew we couldn't get everyone to go all the way down to Richmond but I wasn't aware of people like Mrs. Smith and Mr. McDo in the local area, you know, those, those champions in the community who are doing it on a very consistent basis, just going out there and doing what they can. And I mean, it's, it's been amazing because you get to learn so much and, and even in your interactions with the local community, finding out who those people are, what they did 
and then bringing that back to our organization, you know, really letting them see, you know, just how much um, those cemeteries mean to the people of Hampton. It's, it's really been amazing. I mean, now, I think it's probably an understatement. Now, Hampton is a, it's in America, it's a, a very old place. So who, who are these people who are buried in the, this cemetery? So the two cemeteries, first Elmerton was started, um, actually May 31st, 1858 was when the deed was signed. Um, so it is, both cemeteries are considered historical African-American cemeteries. Elmerton is about three and a half acres and there's approximately 450 interments at Elmerton. Um, and in Elmerton, you have Miss Mary Peep who um, taught enslaved people to read and write before the Civil War um, under the Emancipation Oak um, that is at the entrance to Hampton um, University. You also have um, a Mr. George Fields. He also graduated from Hampton Institute. He was born enslaved. His family um, actually takes the trek by foot over to uh, Fort um, Monroe, but at the time it was uh, Point Comfort. Um, and then after the Civil War, he, like I said, goes to Hampton University, and then he becomes the first African-American student at Cornell Law School in their very first law class. So he was in the very first law class at Cornell. He does come back to Hampton, Virginia, um, practices law, and he actually goes blind, but he still continues. Um, to practice law. And then the final one I'll tell you about in Elmerton is um, Miss uh, Barrett, who um, she would take in young children. She had a homestead in the city of Hampton um, because she was distraught um, whenever she would hear about the courts arresting um, a child because they needed some food and put them in general population. Because at the time you really didn't have a juvenile court and a juvenile justice system. And so she would petition the court and ask them to bring, her, bring them under her care. And so she would um, basically bring them in. Um, she also graduated from Hampton Institute, um, but we have a, so many people um, buried in Elmerton, including um, ministers, and in terms of Bassett, as Elmerton starts to become very full, um, Mr. Andrew Bassett starts the second cemetery um, in the early 1900s, right across the street. Um, and that's about two and a half acres. And they have um, about two, 460 interments at that cemetery. Um, he is um, a wonderful pillar of the community as well. He helped. Um, start a bank for African-Americans along with a club. Because one thing that drew, that drew me to Hampton um, is the fact that it's a little secret, which is we are a waterfront community. We have a beach. And so um, he was part of the trustees to start the colored section of uh, the beach at um, Buckrow Beach area. Um, and so in that, we also have some politicians um, and we still have descendants in this community. So we, um, we actually had an event one time and a, not even just one time, a lot of times we have descendants who are searching for their loved ones. And um, we had one gentleman that said, I will give $25 if you can find my, my descendant. And we were all just like breaking down the, the trees and the weeds to find these headstones that go back to the 1800s. So um, and like I said, you still have those connections and we did have a family, um, three generations, uh, a, grand, a grandchild, her mother and her grandmother um, all out there and they found the grandmother's mother um, burial site. And so it was a learning experience for the grandchild. And it was beautiful to watch that moment when she found her great grandmother. Can I yes. ask Donna how, I'm sorry, um, how did it get to this place? Why? We have to understand why also. Why is it overgrown? What was going on, you know, that, that, a little bit about that. I think it's important to understand. 
So as Waylon mentioned, um, the city did help a little bit, but technically the city does not own the cemetery. And so one other thing um, we have to remember, this is a sacred space. And so cemeteries today, you have a carekeeper. But during the 1800s, people were buying these plots and would get a deed. So it's like buying your own personal property, uh, which I also think is amazing that you had African-Americans in the um, in late 1800s buying this piece of property with a deed to go with it. So you didn't have someone that was assigned to take care of the whole cemetery. You as a family would go to the cemetery and clear the sections. So as, as you fast forward and transitioning, people would leave the city of Hampton and move somewhere else. And then you also have complete families in the resting place. Um, there was a caretaker, Mr. Mitchell, who took care of Bassett for a very long time, over 60 years, but he's passed away now. So he's actually buried in Bassett. So that caretaker is no longer there. And finally, the people that would come out, um, because we, we didn't launch this effort, we're just continuing this great legacy that was started before us, but they're older now. So they, you know, they don't have the ability to go out and cut that grass every weekend. So we're, that's why we're always looking towards the next generation to say, hey, we need your help. And so sometimes those gaps cause those weeds to get as tall as me. So that's so, how it is. So Israel, you decide, you know, you, you have a feeling about, um, you know, George Floyd, you know, Boyce, you have a similar feeling and you decide on this, you know, how do you make a plan and, and, you know, you say it starts as a, it starts as a little tiny thing. And then, you know, you don't know if anybody's going to join you. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people join you. So just how did it, how did it happen? You know, how did that part of it all come together? Sure. The, uh, I think the, the biggest part to highlight is it, the team. Uh, so we serve with a, a pretty incredible organization. And, and when we were having those hard conversations about what had happened with George Floyd Jr., um, I think it was already sparking and we were trying to message and market the desire to come together. You know, uh, Israel highlighted our spirit of service in the military uh, in our community and, and our organization never really did anything uh, organized and together in that fashion. We kind of let everybody go and, and find their, their, their events or whatever it is they wanted to do. Uh, and that's where I looked to him and said, I think it's time for us to bring everyone together and focal, you know, focus on one particular effort. Um, and so the planning over time, I would say a couple of weeks of, you know, Israel meeting Ghana, Israel, you know, collaborating with Waylon, uh, making sure uh, that we, you know, uh, asked volunteers uh, to consider not just to show up, but to also scan the area to see if we had enough tools. Uh, because we're talking everything from lawnmowers to, you know, axes and saws and I mean, some heavy duty, you know, equipment to clear areas. Um, and so I would say that, you know, from the ideas, you know, developments to the first time we got out there, it took us about a month and a half to make sure that we organized properly because the one now thing- is it, Are the do-gooders involved in that already or do you come to it later? How do, how do they get involved? Yeah, so we um, both long before us, definitely. So yeah, you're already uh, doing that. You're already on the mission before. Yes, sir. Um, do-gooders- uh, we got involved with it again, like Ghana said, with, with Dr. Christian, when she called, you just came. There was no questions asked. Um, I met Dr. Christian, oh, probably about five or six years ago, and it was on another level. I, I do um, some, uh, some social work, so I work with um, the youth and uh, folks that have been incarcerated. But um, she had called me about doing some things with uh, some people she knew that needed some help in the community. So that was our first meeting. Um, and then after that, it was, hey, she found out about the do-gooders and what we were doing in the community. And she, um, I was invited to one of her uh, meetings at her house. <laughs> and uh, it was a whole bunch of people sitting around and she was like, this is what I need. And she laid out her plan. Um, they had already been in the cemetery uh, maybe a year or two before this. And she said, this is, a, this is the plan that I have and this is what I want to accomplish. Uh, we went through all the motions with that, and she was like, are you guys in? 
And it's like, you don't say no. So it's like, yes, we're in. So we come out every other weekend um, and we'd help clean, you know, cut the grass and all of that. Uh, but it was like, you know, you can make small progress, you can see some progress, but it was still overwhelming. It was a lot. Yeah. And, so, and that's because and, the grass, the grass really was over your head, Ghana. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, for head, sir. Everybody. Way over. <laughs> Yeah. This was the so, first time I used the machete when the when the military <laughs> came out. I was like, right. teach you how to use a machete. That's that's right. that's another piece of You did great, Ghana, by the way. You did great. Yeah. Yeah. So, so so I mean, so Ghana, you get a call saying, you know, we're we're gonna come, like, you know, Boyce or Israel, you call her and say we're gonna come out there, and you you kind of your thought is that it's like, you know, okay, two or three people are gonna show up. Exactly. Because you know, uh People call all the time and say, hey, and we appreciate the ones and the two people, you know, we don't turn anybody away that wants to help. But, you know, Israel called and he did his uh, pre-investigation, of course, to make sure we were legit as, you know, the military does as always. Um, and so, you know, he showed up with about, I think it was about three or four people. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna bring some more. And I'm like, okay, he's gonna bring another three or four. But that morning, because we would so, start so are these the, the people you showed up with Israel, are they making an assessment of the work? Are these who are the who are these people you're showing up with? Uh, both, both, really. So when I showed up uh, at Colonel Buckner's request, I showed up with the uh, the EOL teams from the different companies. Uh, and the goal was to find out whether or not, you know, Mrs. Smith and Mr. McDew would be people that we would potentially want to partner with, you know, being that, you know, the whole goal was to just bring people together. So, and say about three or four of us showed up and uh, I, I instantly knew that they were, they were the right fit. You know, you know, when you meet good people and they were it, absolutely. Um, and it was amazing to see what they were doing on their own you know, it, it really was the, the representation of fighting the good fight, you know, going out there every time and giving it your best shot and bringing people together to do things that they wouldn't normally do or, or, or make those small changes that become big changes over time. And I said to myself, like, I, I think this is the right group of people. And uh, yeah, I told them I was going to come back with some folks, but I don't think they quite understood I do not what I meant. No, because when I turned <laughs> no. that corner that morning, I was almost yes. in tears because right. we start at seven in the morning. And we were actually they, starting at six then. Yep, yeah, we were starting at six in the morning. <laughs> and so you are so right. The difference was when I turned that corner, not only did I see a whole bunch of pickup trucks, because that's I think that's their requirement to, <laughs> to be in their unit, they have to drive a pickup truck. It was like rows of, it was like so many. And I almost was in tears. And not only were they there, they had already set up stations, which means they had to be there before six in the morning to do these pop-up tents, to put up um, tables and hand sanitizing stations at several locations. I'm not just talking about one. It was at least three or four of them. So I'm like, well, what time did you get here? And this is, when it's dark, you're doing this in the dark, you know? And of course, Israel's like, this is what we do. And I'm like, right. I was just overwhelmed. I was just really overwhelmed to just the, the fact that they were willing to help us was just amazing to me. And Waylon, from your perspective, what, what, what did this mean to you having been working on your do-gooders? What, how did you feel? Well, um, first, I'm, I'm, I am uh, an ex-Army guy myself. So I get all of the military and what we do in the dark. <laughs> but um, I know that morning, I, I come a different way coming to the cemetery. When I came down North King Street, it was blocked. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? So I have to turn around and go all the way back around to get there. But when I pull up, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Something's going on. Somebody's having an event out here and nobody told me. Now I'm mad. <laughs> get there and I'm like, hold up, wait a minute. So I see all these tents. I see all the trucks and I'm like, this man brought Fort Eustis with him, right? <laughs> so it was just one, 
like Ghana said, I was almost in tears just knowing that this many people really cared about what we were doing. And then, like she said, they had everything set up. All we had to do was show up that day. Right? <laughs> Normally, it's like we're there and we're praying that somebody's going to show up to help us. But for that day, it was like we didn't have to do anything except show up and let them know what it was that because that was their question. OK, what do you want us to do? Yeah. And, and we're like, wow. How many people were there? Oh, God, it had to be. I know Our organization, 70 people. Wow. 75. Now, With their, not only the soldiers, but their families as well. Exactly. Well, mil it, military and military families are a certain kind of person. So, yes. so what, what kind of people are military families that, that come out to do this? So I, I would tell you that um, it, is, it is a family that um, has you know, that, that firm belief of the ideals of the freedoms of this country, um, that has a genuine love uh, and makes a sacrifice every day that our country sometimes is unaware of, and that's okay. Um, because they don't do it for the recognition. They do it because of, out of a sense of duty to support their service member. You know, I, um, when I think about what my wife has had to give up, uh, and you have to excuse me a little bit, just uh, she's an amazing woman. And my family's pretty amazing too. And I would tell you that seeing our families, uh, the children especially, see the example of their, their soldier, their family member, show how we can, can still find unity amidst so much division. Uh, to me, that, that tells you it's not just the, the character by my words, but their, their actions speak of their character uh, because they're still there. And, uh, and you see them now asking, okay, when's the next event? Uh, and what can they do? And it's, it's very special. Um, it's almost like you're watching, you know, that, that change that we all hope for in the future happening right before your eyes. Um, so if that helps. Now, now Ghana, had you, because you've been going to the cemetery longer than anybody, but had it been a long time since you had seen it with, the, with all the grass actually cut down? I have to say, Elmerton, all three and a half acres are cut down. And I've never seen all three and a half acres cut down. I was so pleased this spring. I was able to see the, the daffodils out, you know, and it was so beautiful to see the flowers and, and the headstones. And one thing that I have to also say about this unit is that they were determined to see it to completion. It's not just about this is this one event that I want to go to and we're going to check off. I did my community service. They were, they are, not even were, they still are very committed um, to the completion of this project. And the, the children and the families that come out, it's amazing. The children would run up because the first time they would, I was challenging them, find me the oldest headstone. And they would run up to me and say, I found something from 1883 and they would pull my arm over. And so they became invested and even the soldiers, like after they would work so hard in the heat in the summer, they would sit on the back of those beds of the pickup trucks and say, tell me a story about someone here. And so it became, they became part of this community, uh, which was so beautiful to see. You know, Boyce, you mentioned something. Um, you know, we are living in a difficult time. There's a lot sure. of division, we know, and a lot of pain everywhere in this country. Yep. And so, you know, how important is this? As it's, you know, we're crying over here listening to this story. We weren't even there. I mean, that's why Jesse, I think, wanted to reach out yeah. because it is such an important moment of it and a, and a, and a, a model you know for how we we need to be together and how we need to work together because it's not only the military coming in and supporting but these children finding there's a history historical context not just for african-american children it's for all children to understand like how important how can this project really be a much larger example of where we all need to try to go out from all of you i'd love to hear
Yeah, I would tell you, I think the best person to speak on that is Ghana. Um, and that's because she is already moving in that direction and has some great things underway. You know, what I can tell you is, is that from, from a military standpoint, you know, and I can't speak on behalf of the entire Department of Defense, I can just say what Boyce Buckner believes in his heart is that um, we have, have just used this opportunity uh, to connect our communities and demonstrate how you turn positive words into positive action. And taking leaders like Israel, who, like I said, watch him uh, in 10 years, he will be, you know, in the rising ranks of our army uh, and he will inspire his unit and imagine that and multiply that by 100, you know, or 300 and that permeates across our entire organization. And so I think that, you know, our hope on, on the, on the unit side was to be able to help drive that change within our families, our civilians and our soldiers uh, and to be stewards of our profession to show everybody that our army is not just about, you know, and, and what we're about is not necessarily just, you know, fighting and winning war. It is, it is literally, we are citizens, we are part of our country and we are very proud and love that. Uh, and that when people are in need, uh, you only need to call, right? Uh, because that is, that is really what people refer to with a soldier is that we answer the nation's call. And I think that that's what, what we were answering at that time. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, we, we have these, co we um, belong now to a coalition. I belong with a group of people that are doing this work across the country. So what you see in Hampton is just a story that can be retold in Atlanta, um, in Alabama, in Maryland and so forth, um, and throughout Virginia as well. And so um, one thing that we're trying to do go for going forward, one is, I get asked all the time, like, how did you make this connection? And I remind them the connection is just not about the labor. It's also about the community. It's building your community, um, getting to know people because um, a lot of the soldiers are not from here, you know? And so this is a, a sense of family as well for them. Like you can build a family relationship and you can do more than just this work in the cemetery. You can get to know their families and so forth. Um, currently there's legislation that we're trying to get passed as well um, that is in the Senate uh, study bill, because as I said, these sacred spaces, um, we hear articles, see articles all the time about people building on top of these cemeteries. I just visited one in Charlottesville that's um, ran by the Daughters of Zion which is actually a benevolence club that was started by Mary Peake. And, he, um, and so they actually have a monument to the unknown. And because there is a lot, even though I gave numbers of how many people that are buried, there are so many that we don't know because one, people couldn't afford headstones. So there's no headstone there. Two, time might've um, taken the headstone where it might've been destroyed. And then three, the sad part is like we said, um, people building on top of it, roads being on top. So um, so just the recognition of that as well. So we're hoping that the study bill passes um, so that we can do a study and get a register, um, public and private, because these are sacred spaces and not everybody wants it to no be known where they are. So, so we have to respect that as well the descendants of that. So, um, so those are some of just some of the things that we're working on going forward. And then, like I said, bringing in that young generation. So um, bringing in the fold, like high school students to help do some drone pictures of the cemetery along with documenting and learning some history. So just moving it forward as well. So Israel, you know, you, uh, you arrive in the, uh, the middle of the night um in darkness you know or the early morning and then you you're all there all day long and at by the end of the evening it's gone from you know weeds as high as you can see and i assume by the end of the when you get to the end of the day you actually can see the headstones and and so you know what what goes through your mind when you know it goes from being a project about bringing people together to being a project about you know, seeing all these people laid out in front of you who've been there for since 1800s? I was floored, to be totally honest with you. Um, 
I can remember getting there that morning, going through the motions of everything and, you know, kind of reactively based off of what I've kind of been trained to do throughout the years, you know, putting up the tents and, and having my con op and, you know, deciding that this is what we're going to do and we're going to plant things here and there. But you're really just going through the motions at the time because that's what you're trained to do. And um, then all of a sudden, you know, you see all these cars start to pull up and you get to see all of these people showing up. And I can remember just having this like this sense of, of being overwhelmed mm -hmm. day because I was so proud of my organization and what they decided to do on their own. We only asked that they showed up. There was no one that was told that they had to be there. So everyone that was there that day was there because they, they did so of their own volition. Um, there's a jet going over on the airfield. Um, and, you know, when I saw Colonel Buckner finally, I was, I was, you know, I hadn't expected it to be that much. I knew the work that needed to be done. I, I knew what I hoped would happen, you know, but I didn't know exactly how things were gonna go about that day. So for all those people from my organization to show up because of this small idea and do all the work that they did, I mean, there were trash bags full of grass for like as far as the eye could see that day. And, you know, as we went through and you could see the work being done, you know, it went from grass four to five feet tall to being, you know, just a cemetery. It was like we discovered a cemetery, you know? And, and every time I get to walk through with Ghana and learn the history of all that stuff, it's like, it's, it's really, I can't put it in words enough how elated and how exciting the entire project has been, you know? You, you, don't, you don't know the great things that are going on around you and to get to discover it every time that we go out there and then to get to share it with people. You know, there, there's, there's, not enough, there's not enough words that I could say about how exciting that is. You know, I was, I was floored to be totally honest. Waylon, for you, do you think, you know, how important is it for, for the, the folks that have been buried there that you talk you know, dignity and respect now and that there's a resting place and what that really means and you're also also a military man. What, is, what does it mean to have that there in this way? Um, <clears throat> I think right now they're all smiling down at us that we've continued to do this work, that someone actually thought enough of them to do this because um, I remember the cemetery uh, back in 2012. Um, I was part of a crew that used to go out there with the sheriff's department and take care of those cemeteries. So I've seen what it could be and what it had turned into. Um, to, to get it to the point that it is now and just that it's just, it was a sense of pride for me because um, one thing with our organization to do good as of Hampton Roads is to speak good, teach good, and, and just go on uh, acts of community kindness is what we, we teach. So to have that from total strangers that have no investment in the projects that we're doing and for them to be so excited to come out and share in what we were doing. And it, and it actually became, like Israel said, it was a, you know one thing with being in the military, we're competitive. Um, so it became a challenge. You know, I know these guys, but they were challenging themselves um, to see how much we could do day, how much we can get done in a few hours. Well, now we can look back and see how much we got done in a year. Um, and like Ghana said, it's been at least two years since we were able to see the entire cemetery. Okay, so for me, um, and, and not only just with the cemetery, and I have to say this about this particular unit, uh, after the season was over with for last year from uh, cleaning and cutting the cemetery, they actually came out and helped with our projects in the community uh, because uh, we do uh, Christmas feeding on Christmas day mm -hmm. every year. We do uh, turkey giveaways during Thanksgiving. 
We do uh, back to school drives, what we call our um, Shell Road Community Fest, where we give away school supplies and, and, and they were there to help with those events. So now not only have they come just for the cemetery project, they've really become a part of the community. So, and I, and I tease Colonel Buckner about this a lot. Um, all right, what are we gonna do when you leave? Because, you know, we wanna make sure that the next guy that comes in is on board. And I would say that to him and, you know, um, there's truth in every joke, but I would say that to him every week that we would see each other, but he would ensure to me that because he is getting ready to leave that the other commander coming in would be on board. And I, I pray that that's gonna be the truth. Um, and I believe his words. Okay, <laughs> so, so now I'm excited about one, this is another season for us to go out and continue to do what we were doing, but it's also a time where we're going to see new soldiers coming in, we're going to see um, new leadership coming in, and hopefully we're going to get some new community members coming in, and just to make this project um, more successful uh, and sustainable. Um, you know, uh you know, what is it, we do live in a time of such divisiveness. And, you know, this may have been uh, Mary's mission, uh, Mary Christian's mission, but what does this say about our future? You know, do, do we're always talking in such uh, negative terms, but this does show that there is a way forward for cooperation and, and uh, a way, um, you know, out of the darkness. I mean, what, what, what do you, what do you guys think about that? Uh, uh, if I, I, I think it shows uh, ultimately that we're bigger than our differences. You know, um, our opinions are not all the same. We're not monolithic at all. But at the end of the day, you know, we're all striving towards a greater good. And when you can invest yourself in things that are bigger than you, you know, the sky is the limit in what you can accomplish. And I think that, that you know, this really shows that. It really shows that, you know, when we all put aside our differences and, and dedicate ourselves to something, you know, greater than what we think, that, that you know, we truly can move mountains. Um. I think that one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing and, and hoping is that one, when they bring, the, when the kids come out, um, they are so excited to be there and, and to help out that I see that these kids, regardless of where they go with their family, because they're gonna deploy sometime in the future, I see them coming back. And if they don't, actually come back to Hampton Roads, I see them taking that with them wherever they go. But I see them as adults doing this work. I really do. Because just like you said, when you learn the history of the cemeteries and, and the purpose, because really, I think when they first came out, it was just, okay, mom and dad got me out here in this <laughs> field cutting grass, right? Or picking up grass or raking or whatever it was doing. They didn't really know what they were out there for and what it meant to other people. But I think they really grasped what it's really about. And, and, I, I, and I have to say kudos to those family members that are doing that and showing their children what service really is. Anna, we need to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't echo enough what everybody has said already, but what it also means to me is that the amazing people that are buried there are still pillars of our community because they're pulling together us um, to work together. And so I think that is amazing yeah. that someone from the 1800s can still connect to someone in 2021. And even though we might look different on the outside, they're pulling us together and they're pulling us together in ways that in the 1800s, they could not even imagine. These are people that some of them were born enslaved and to know now that there is unity within our community and it's helping them and we're pulling together. I think that that also is amazing to see. 
We want to thank you all so much. This is an incredible story. It's a model for everyone who's watching and listening. Find out more about what, what this incredible group that come together has done and think about what, what you can do, what we can all do in our own communities and think about working together and what that means. And I, you know, I think you said you started with just having a meal together and it just, it, it's about talking with each other and listening and finding out how how we can help each other. So thank you. We're just so honored that you came yeah, here. Thank, thank you, everybody, very much. Really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having us. Yes, thank, thank you. you.